uh, Paul Rose, what can you say about Paul Rose? He's a man on the front line of exploration. He's one of the world's most experienced divers, field scientists, and polar experts. He helps scientists unlock and communicate global mysteries in the most remote and challenging places on the planet. His current gig as expedition leader for the National Geographic Pristine Seas has taken him all over the world, uh, exploring some of the most amazing uh, and remote uh, ocean wild places. Uh, he's an experienced television presenter and radio broadcaster. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to visit Antarctica, but I don't know if I would be commander, base commander of Rothra Research Station for a decade with the British Antarctic Survey. You gotta love the cold. Uh, and for that service, he was awarded uh, Her Majesty the Queen's Polar Medal. So even a mountain was named after him in Antarctica. So I wonder, Paul, have you had a chance to to gaze at that mountain, maybe even climb it? Do you know, I did before it was named. It was a it's a peak not far from Rothera Base. And in my, in my second Antarctic, no, my third Antarctic season, which was my first at Ro based from Rothera. Uh, there's a journey I made down through the Shambles Glacier, and that peak is up above it. And um, it's a very technical place to be. I loved working in there. So although I know it and I've been on top of it and all around, and I've done most of my higher thinking in those regions, as you well said, all the best ideas come from the wild places, and I've had a lot of great ideas there. So then one day I received an envelope, and it could have been, could have been an electricity bill. It was just one of those envelopes, you know? And uh, it was from the Antarctic Place Names Committee. And you, it's like anything, Joe. You don't know how much it means to you until it, until it happens. Sure, I absolutely. I blown away with this thing. And I got a, a lovely map and a certificate. And, uh, yeah, just one of those surprising things. Great. Very, very cool. Well, the last thing I want to say before I, I throw it to you is thank you. Thank you for taking my call three weeks before last year's Biodiversity Festival and saying yes. And then thank you for the one for this year when I said, remember last year? What if we did 72 hours straight? <laughs> you can count on me, Joe. That kind of stuff is a green light. When you tell me it's a, a mad idea or it's going to be, it's a green light to you and me. So come on. It's great to be here with you, Joe. Running alongside you and the gang. Couldn't be better. All right, Paul, we're going to let you take over for a little bit. Take us to those pristine seas. All right, mate. Well, here we go, everybody. Uh, it's, it's me again. I'm back. And this time I'm talking about um, my love of science support, particularly when, it, when it's in the cold places or, or diving. So a quick briefing on how I got there and what I do with it with pristine seas. It would just take me a second to pull up my, um, my images. Uh-oh. Now then, Joe, what do I do here? Oh, that looks good. You should just, oh, sorry. <laughs> so I, it's funny, isn't it? I've been sharing a screen on everything except StreamYard. Okay, sh share screen. Yep. And then pick that option for um, your entire screen. That's usually the smoothest. Thank you, buddy. Is that it? Oh, here it comes. Perfect. You've got it, huh? Yeah, click on the presentation so it comes up to the front for us. got it on. Uh, okay, well, that's great. Hang on a second. Beautiful. We got oh, it. Great. Thank you, Joe. Sorry for the confusion, everybody. There you go. I've been setting everyone up for their, their talks, but I suddenly realized that one thing I hadn't done was share my own screen. Well, that's not a picture of me. But as a young boy, I had that in mind. When I was 11, all I could think about was being Mike Nelson in the sea hunt things. I was terrible at school, couldn't engage with anything. I, I had a sense of field science and adventure and exploration, but not doing well at school and most certainly not been anything close to diving. It was the dream of looking like this and indeed even like this. Mike Nelson, he was having proper underwater battles. He was rescuing pilots from crashed airplanes and men from flooded mines. Seemed to me like all the beautiful women in the world fell in love with Mike, and I thought, well, maybe that's the trick. If I become a diver, I'll have loads of days with beautiful women. I mean, I was, I was going to be an adventurer. But how to get there? Well, it was an inspirational teacher, someone just like Joe Gabowski. His name's Mr. Gray. And if I ever get the chance to do some time traveling, I'll go back to see him or bring him here so I can thank him properly. And it's that opening doors, opening access, making people 
realize that you can live your dream. It's all right to live your dream. You don't have to go down a, a set of railroad tracks. You can live your dream. So by becoming a diver, and I've been a certified diver since 1969, I discovered something called science support. And what that is, there's a whole industry of science where scientists in the field need other staff, specialized pilots, specialized teams, obviously like pilots and divers and climbers and medics and dentists and IT people, but they also need people just like me, people that can just basically turn their hand to lots of practical activities. So that's a great one. On small projects, something like this, which is us in Greenland at Packetsock, collecting ancient methane, uh, methane from 11,000 year old ice. Um, you just needed to get be able to do anything. So I think the ratio of scientist to science support staff was, was about sort of one to one. We were pretty even. Um, on more complex projects like this on the Taylor Glacier, we had about, I think the ratio was about two to one. So two support staff to each scientist because there's a lot of technical equipment to run both outside and inside, keeping this stuff running. And of course, you can't go wrong with being the, the head waste organizer. That's me, a job I love to do. And that's organize all the waste, ready to get it flown out by a helicopter. And even jobs like this, working for NASA. I worked for NASA on uh, Mount Erebus in Antarctica, uh, the uh, Mars Lander project. And the idea was that Mount Erebus was as close as NASA could find to what might be Mars. And so how to test all the equipment and the landers was a job to do on Mount Erebus. And I led that project too. So you end up with a project like that, where the sort of scientists to support staff is amazing. There's a lot of jobs out there. And I think you'll agree with me, even at a place like Rothera, which is inarguably the most beautiful field research station in the world. That's my old base. I was the base commander there for 10 years. We've got, like many Antarctic programs, a science support to scientist ratio of about three or four to one. There's a lot of specialized activities, twin ship operations, helicopter operations, aircraft on, on wheels on, on, on the runway. Uh, aircraft uh, deep field like the Hercules you see there on skis and the small workhorses, the real pickup trucks of Antarctica, the Twin Otters. Uh, camping the remote places, you need science support, you're doing science there and you need someone to build camps and keep things running, keep the skidoos operating. So that's one of my camps very close to the South Pole. And for me as a diver, the highlight of all of that work was being underwater for science. I'm no scientist, but somehow I have an affinity for it and understand what it takes to collect long-term data sets. There's us at Rothera, uh, that's Lloyd Peck with the yellow bucket, with the green bucket. And he had a project to study climate change by looking at the shells of limpets. A beautiful project, you know, limpet shells grow a little bit like sort of tree rings. And so by collecting lots of limpets over a long period of time, we could see how the degradation in sea ice was a trigger for measuring past climate. And by getting yourself in powerful places, you can tell big stories. So as a diver working for BBC, talking about climate and the Arctic sea ice, it's no good standing in front of a green screen and describing uh, what might happen up in the Arctic. The best way is to go there. So going up, talking about the fact that it won't be very long, and then we won't see any multi-year ice in the Arctic Sea. Um, all we'll see is single-year ice, except for a few rare places. The way to tell that story is to go a long way north and for me to dive in the caves that are formed in these massive icebergs that occur over multi-years. Because what happens is a television audience at home on the sofa, half the audience are going, wow, that's great, I'd love to do that. The other half of the audience have got their hands over their eyes going, oh my God, I'd never do it. But either way, you've got 100% of the audience listening to the stories of, 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 of the loss of sea ice up in the Arctic. And all of that led to this project, Pristine Seas. You can see we've been busy. It was started by a genius uh, doctor, a great friend of mine, Dr. Enric Saller, who was at Scripps. He was a professor, still is a professor. And he made this statement. He said, you know, every single science paper I write is a bit like writing the obituary of the ocean. So what can he do that felt like action? So he came up with a project 
to find, explore, and help protect the last pristine, truly wild places in the ocean. You can see we've been busy. We've had 31 expeditions. We've created, helped to create 23 marine reserves, totaling over 6 million square kilometers. This is our method. Um, when we're shallow, down to 50 meters or at the surface, we're scuba diving, we're using baited cameras. Um, at further depth, we're using these op open water cameras for long periods of time. Uh, deeper down on the mesophytic region, we're using rebreathers, mixed gas rebreathers. It's complicated. And one of the most efficient ways of doing that is to work in our submarine that we use on the Argo, which is the deep sea. That goes down to 400 meters. And then at full depth, all the way down to the bottom of the Mariana Trench and back up, which is the trick, we use the drop cameras, which are baited cameras. Um, so that's what it, that's our method. And um, here's what it looks like. And of course, before we get to the point where we're at sea, there's a fair bit of work to do. And it looks exactly as you can imagine. There's a bunch of us get together with National Geographic maps and big plans. And we are successful because instead of just falling in love with a place and then working out how to get it protected, we make it a better horse to back. So we work out the scientific case for the protection of this region um, and also the political opportunity. We run those two columns together and then work on approximately a 10 year plan. We've now got a third column to deal with. And that third column is called post COVID recovery. We're, ma we're managing that well now. And thank heavens, um, we're all back at sea in October, back to the Pacific. One of my most favorite jobs is working out what ship we're going to use. We, we always had a dream that maybe we'd be a bit like Cousteau and travel the world on our version of Calypso. But as it is, we move a bit too fast from different global regions. Um, so we just have to charge the ships where we can. From the James Clark Ross, which was a personal favorite of mine, because I remember when she was brand new, and I sailed on her in Antarctica. So I always felt of her as my ship. It was quite something to go into British Antarctic Survey headquarters and be on the other side of the table and negotiate chartering the James Clark Ross. This was for our Ascension Island expedition a few years ago. One of the smallest ships we charter is this one, the Great Argo. She's based in Costa Rica. And yet she's small, but she is without a doubt our most favorite charter vessel. Um, she's built for diving. 
So everywhere you turn, it's quite obviously set up for diving. It feels like home. It's absolutely brilliant. And at the bottom of the picture, you see the yellow submarine there. She's the home to the deep sea submarine. And that really opens up our reach. When we're in the water, what are we doing? Well, we're counting fish, we're counting stuff. We've got that great template to remember that we take that template and transfer it all the way, all around the world on every single expedition, no matter what kind of water we're diving in. Here's our chief scientist, Alan Friedlander, Dr. Alan Friedlander. And we often speak about, you know, how do we know if a place is pristine or not? How can it possibly be measured as pristine? Well, there are lots of scientific methods of doing it. But my favorite is to make that first dive with Alan and look at him. And just in those first few moments of a dive, I can see by his eyes as to, and his general body position as to what he thinks of a place. It's really something to dive in these powerful places and realize, particularly if there's lots of sharks, which is a great indicator of pristineness, that we're no longer the top of the food chain. It's a great moment. So very unscientific, but it seems to work every time. Dive with Alan on the first dive and have a good look at him in the first couple of minutes. We dive not just in warm places, but cold places. This is up as us up at the Northwest Passage a few years ago. Um, but we get that pleasure of being with sharks. We get that sense of swimming around and go, oh, you know, look where we are. Because we, we're all divers. We all love the ocean. We're all doing uh, vital work, we feel, with science and, and compelling media to tell that story. But it's wonderful, I must say, to be amongst uh, this kind of life on a relatively regular basis. We can't dive all the time. You can't just go in the water and spend all day there. We need help. And these are the pelagic cameras, these baited cameras. They drift around at about 20 meters for a few hours at a time. We put them in multiple times through the day and they record all of their, all of the behavior that comes whizzing past. These things are drop cameras I described. These things go all the way to the bottom of the Mariana Trench and back up. And it tells you how little we know about the ocean, the deep ocean, when you realize that on most occasions, we either discover something brand new or something previously undescribed or the first record of this particular uh, animal in that place. There's so much unknown in the depths and that's one of the main triggers. If you needed a reason to be an ocean explorer, just follow the work of the what we do with the drop cam. We've got the submarine on the Argo. And it's great to be, there's me and John Betts in there, to be deep and to be able to report and record on what's going on. Our normal format is Schmulik, who's the pilot you see behind, and then two scientists in the front. It means they can have long dives down to 400 meters, three hours, three, three and a half hours, doing, doing really great detailed studies. It's a terrific tool to use. We also use it to make sure that global leaders country leaders, ministers of various departments and influencers in countries that want to protect their oceans go deep in the submarine. It's one of the best investments we can do because sometimes it's their first time that they've actually had a chance to see, uh, experience, understand, and then fall in love with their own ocean. And from that, we know it gives them the tools to protect it. So aside from all of that, I'd say, the very best investment we do with time is to work with Joe Grabowski and exploring by the seat of your pants and the Explorer Classroom Sessions. You can you imagine? It's great. It's the kind of thing we would have dreamed of only a few years ago is to be at sea and usually on the first day of sailing, we connect with Joe who links us up with stacks of classrooms all around the world. And we are with them for about 45 minutes. We're telling our story. We're answering questions from the young ones. We do it again near the end of the expedition so we can report on our findings. It's a wonderful thing. It's one of the best things we can ever do. And if you do get the chance um, after the sessions, uh, do go on YouTube and look at Joe's Exploring by the Sea to Your Pants classroom sessions. You get a feel for what Joe does when he's not running the Global Biodiversity Festival. And this is what it looks like to us. It looks glorious from, from the schools and the classrooms. Um, for us, this is what it looks like. Uh, we're, going, we're staring at my phone on a very big tripod and um, it doesn't use much bandwidth and that seems the best way of doing these sessions. And we also open up the ship whenever we can to young ones. Often enough, we're working in places where there is no habitation, no one lives there. But when we are near or at a place where there's young ones, where there's people on people there, communities, 
we bring them on board. We bring them in. Because let's face it, those young ones that see us on their phones or in their classrooms or come on board and see what we're up to are just like little Paul Roses when he was 11, thinking, oh, wow, I'd love to dive. I'd love to do anything other than be in this terrible classroom. I want to be out there doing something. Well, my advice to everybody is to get stuck into science support. So if you're a young one watching or if you're an older one watching and you just wanted, to, what can you do different? How can you get involved? We've heard lots of people saying about our impact on society, how we can address these global issues by activities. Then consider science support in that suite of activities you can do. There's a lot of work out there. It's a big growing industry. And it's done me no harm whatsoever. And if you need any help on getting involved in uh, science support, drop me a line via my website there and I'll do everything I can to help you. I've got a whopping great file to help you. Thanks very much. All right. Oh, good. My mic's on. Good. Uh, Paul, always great to see. Um, I mean, you must be like a kid in a candy store. Anytime you... You get the ship pulls up to one of those pristine places. You're gearing up for that first dive, wondering in anticipation what you're going to find when you hit the water. Uh, must be something. It really is. It's that first dive. I often think of that, Joe, and it's a, it's a great way to think about our project is that often we're in a place where only a few people have dived. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're in places many times where no one has ever dived, so we have no idea what's down there. So even though we're gearing up and getting ready, you begin, can begin to feel a bit routine. You're a very experienced diver yourself. You know that we're often, you know, putting the gear together all feels a bit of a little technical routine. But as soon as we roll off that boat or jump off the ship, it's brand new. And what a feeling, Joe. My dream is to get you with us because I speak to you so much when, when we're at sea, but we need to get you with us. How do I we can that? find a lot of fun stuff to do live from the ship through the whole expedition. It'd be pretty cool. I think so. We've got to work on it, Joe. I'd love, I would love to see you and see with us. And and when them young ones come on, oh, I always think of little Paul Roses, you know, <laughs> struggling along, can't do anything, uh, only good at sports or getting out of school, hanging around with a pretty rough bunch of mates. Um, we all loved each other, but we were in a race to the bottom, hating all the teachers and everything. Sorry, Joe, you're a teacher. Um, and just desperate to find a practical physical engagement with important things. And for me, it was my love of diving, bumping into something called science support and understanding that science projects need a lot of support who aren't scientists. And I thought that's for me and that's been my whole life. All right, well, fair enough. I mean, that's, that's the goal, right? To find something you're passionate about and make it your career. And then uh, it just doesn't feel like work. Exactly. What's the old saying, Joe? If if you get it right, you haven't worked a day in your life. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Although I, I have a feeling some of the logistics with those expeditions, moving a sub from here to there, I'm sure that's not all fun and games. That's right. There are problems. We we have things. We have bad weather to deal with, the schedule slipping to equipment breaking and people getting exhausted and all that kind of stuff. But But, you know, we're all living the same dream. So we're all on that single aim and the trick to expeditions particularly science expeditions is to have one single aim and then have all the supporting objectives clearly ranked so you know the our idea and every decision that i make at sea is will this decision help to get this place protected and that's something that we all have so it might be seemingly routine should we steam this way or that way or should we go over there and do that project before this or when should we fill the cylinders or should we service the Zodiacs? Then no matter what it is, I think, hang on, is this going to help us get the protect? And I tell you, we all do that. And that helps. So even if even if we're all pretty fed up and want to go home for one reason or the other, we just keep that in mind. Fair enough. You know, I, I go back to when we recorded the interview with the, um, the biodiversity pledge with or finance for biodiversity. And, uh, you know, you talked about that thread that thread from the field, uh, you know, to the to the halls of investment, to the big, the big banks, the big investments. So I'm wondering, uh, you know, how do you feel uh, seeing that in action? Just seeing how how excited people are, seeing 18 new signatories uh, joining the pledge. Um, you know, we're talking big sums of money and big investments. Uh, that's got to make you pretty excited and make you feel like all that time in the field sliding in 
you know, into the ice, uh, anything that can happen. O-ring go on your tank. I mean, it's got to make it all worthwhile taking all those samples. It really does, Joe. And that's a message. That's a new message for me that I want to get out because I've often talked about the silver thread. And many years ago, I used to be uh, going to big conferences and saying, where, where is that going? Where is our data going? Is it driving decision making? Is it driving smart investments? And, all that? and now I can go and say it is. So it works both ways because it, it helps um, the economic world, which helps all of us, makes it more sustainable. But it also is an amazing, it's the ultimate motivator for people in the field so you're absolutely right joe i mean to credit to all of them it's given us a whole new sense of inspiration we love it yeah yeah well i go back to what what will said from aviva that you know what's the point in retiring if you're not going to have a good quality planet so. yeah exactly he was great saying that i loved interviewing him he was there in the car pulled into a to a to a station to charge up his electric car he had a sandwich with him and he was just you know, desperate to get his message out and it was such an important message that you can have sure. any kind of financial investment but if in you know 10 20 30 years it it gives you loads of money but also um a damaged planet what's the point i loved him yeah yeah absolutely well paul i think it's come that time i've got to take a trip to osa conservation we got to go live uh to costa rica we're going to check yeah. out an amazing uh well, I'm just going to bring it in and, and we'll check it out. We're going to check out an amazing uh, farming in the rainforest. You know, you don't hear about sustainability and farming often, but this is pretty special. So Fantastic. I was, I was there a few years ago and love it. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks a lot, Joe. All right. We'll see you soon, Paul. Bye, mate.